Hello, I'm Bronwyn Williams. We're back with The Small Print. And today my guest is Ray Hartley. Ray, on this show, we always ask our guests to introduce themselves. So Ray, who are you? What do you do? Where are you in the world? And what do you care about? Right. Well, I'm a research director at the Brentis Foundation, which is a think tank uh, based in Joburg that works in Africa on economic policy. And uh, before that, I was a journalist. And I was in something called the print media. I don't know if you remember that. It was uh, quite a big deal of, you know, a couple of decades ago. Um, yeah, so I worked at the Sunday Times and, and a few other places. Okay, and what is what does the Brain Toast Foundation do? What is what is your mission there? What are you trying to achieve in this world? So what we're trying to bring about uh, rational discussions of policy. We're trying to get away from the the sort of very heated exchange and try and go to what are the facts and what are the facts directing us to do policy-wise. And we do a lot of work in Africa. So we work with governments, we work with oppositions, um, anybody who makes the request that we think we have the resources to assist. Okay, so so first interesting question then, who who doesn't like the work that you're doing? I think that's always interesting, especially if you work in a think tank space. Yeah, you... well, I, think, I think populists don't like it because they don't like to be called out. Um, so when you try and say the facts dictate that we should be taking this policy approach, frequently you get very emotional responses from politicians and the like. And certainly from the ideologues. Um, so yeah, I think that would be that would be our main uh, critics, shall we say? Okay, that's that's always interesting to start with. But um, the reason that we asked you on the show is to talk about your new book that you've got out, which is in parallel to a lot of the conversations we've been having in the lead up to what seems to be a rather important election for South Africa, 30 years on for democracy. Uh, Generation Z is turning 30 years old. It's like it seems to be a bit of a, a year where we kind of have to make a choice about our future. And anyway, you together with some of your colleagues put together a book that really outlines some scenarios for South Africa coming into the 2024 election cycle. Uh, do you want to tell me just a little bit about that before I put words into your mouth? Yeah. No, I think it's uh, it was a good exercise to do to try and sort of say step out of the maelstrom and look at uh, what are the move, big cogs that are moving that are going to actually determine where the country goes in the future. So, yeah, it was a, it was a great exercise. It was done before, um, more famously, I must say, by Ken Santa in the early 90s when the country faced a, a really momentous moment. And he produced scenarios which actually helped move everybody or shift everybody's discussion to try and deal with the the emerging reality of compromise and negotiation. And we thought the country's at a similar moment now. Um, you know, we've had 30 years of single party dominance. We're about to go into a coalition government environment, uh, either this coming election or certainly by the next election. And what does that mean? How does that change things? And what are the possible outcomes of that? Okay, so tell me a bit about the methodology you took. So, I mean, I know a bit about features and that sort of thing, but most people have no idea what scenarios are or any of the, the weird little mental models or matrices that people like myself and yourself try to persuade other people to pay us to put together. So um, can you can you explain the methodology you used when you came up with these scenarios? And even describe in your own word what a scenario is. Yeah, so I think a scenario is not a prediction um, because it's impossible to actually contain all the variables. And we're in a world now where the variables really move quickly. So you may have a major global conflict flaring up next week, uh, just as you predicted something else. So they're not predictions, they're more an exercise to say, these are the possible paths that we could go on. Um, and also to try and in our case, because we're a policy think tank, we try and focus on well, what are the policy choices made now? How will they play out going forward? Okay, so, so yeah, carry on. 
Yeah, no, sorry, I feel a bit like uh, I'm, a, I'm a pupil here. I mean, you, you're in the futures business, so please feel free to criticize our methodology. I mean, I think that there are a lot of uh, sort of rules of the game that we have to follow. These are things that we believe are pretty immutable and will, will continue to be the case going forward into the future. And then there are all the variables that, that, that come into play, things that are within our power to change and alter and make decisions about. So we try and move through the process of doing those two, two separate stages. And then we arrived at this matrix of um, possible futures. Yeah, so scenario is basically like a picture of what the future can look like, but it's not just one. There are a few different pictures, a few different stories that we could end up yeah. walking. And yeah. as you see, kind of chosen yeah. of key variables as indicators as to more, less, better, worse, basically, which is what you tend yeah. to do with these things. So either sort of the the best case scenario, the mid case scenario, and the worst case scenario, or in your case, kind of a sort of matrix grid where you're looking at two critical variables and sort of dividing up the possible futures into what happens if those two variables get more intense or less intense. So what were the two sort of variables that you put together in this in this case? Yeah. Did you think uh, are critical? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, on our matrix, we have um, weak economic growth and strong economic growth, and we have poor governance and good governance. So in the quadrant, we have good governance and good economic growth. You have the good scenario playing out. Um, and obviously in the uh, opposite quadrant, you have the worst case scenario, ugly scenario playing out, uh, bad governance and, and low economic growth. And then we have the other two variables, one of which is uh, we call the ugly, which is basically carrying on the way we're carrying on at the moment, um, which isn't a neutral thing. It doesn't mean we will continue to be the way we are. I think carrying on the way we're carrying on leads to a slow, slower, but nonetheless notable decline. Yeah. Um, uh, what's, what's quite notable about all your scenarios, none of them are particularly cheerful, right? Like, yeah. Uh, the good scenarios, there's some there's some cheer there, I think. Well, what is the good scenario? What is what is the, the sort of best case that you were able to envisage when you started looking? I think it's 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 repeating what the country's done before, but perhaps more focused on the economy. So it's the great South African center that came together and and actually pulled pulled out a constitution in in the early nineties that brought the country together. If that center can get together and produce an economic policy framework that actually addresses growth and inclusivity, then I think we're, we're on the money. So the question is, how does that center take shape? What are the, what are the ways in which we could produce that kind of outcome? Um, so obviously it's got to do with parties getting together that share a certain view of uh, economic policy and the way that it should unfold and fiscal and financial policy for government as well. Um, and there are, at, at the moment, I think it's more likely than it has been for 30 years that such a prospect would emerge. But then of course, there are also big threats. You know, there's, there's the possibility of populist coalitions taking the opposite direction. Yeah, I, I did find that interesting that your best case scenario was around the, the coalition government, which might seem a pragmatic way forward. But the truth is, in the, the few attempts that we have had at, um, shall we say, coalition government in South Africa have been far from exceptional. I mean, yeah. Johannesburg is, is a fantastic example. There. Even Cape Town, too, in the, in the days when there were sort of coalitions, but didn't exactly work too well. Like, how how do you actually envisage a coalition playing out? Like who could actually be in that coalition as soon as next year that would actually work? What what yeah. marriage can you possibly or, or or even dating relationship can you see among the parties that would be required to get to a ruling majority? How how is this how is this a credible scenario for next year? That's that's the <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that is the multi-trillion dollar question. Um, no, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, if you look at the municipal coalitions, firstly, I think it's learning curve and 
you know, these are the first attempts really on a large scale to do coalitions. But there are still, you know, more than a, um, you know, more than 40 coalitions operating in the country quite well. The Joburg example is not great, and it's very prominent because Joburg is a major city. <laughs> but there are many other coalitions operating at the municipal level that are, are functional um, throughout the country and in smaller territory. I would also say that, you know, the way that um, parties allocate their personnel, you know, the A team goes to national, the B team goes to provincial, the C team and whoever else is left in the room kind of goes to local. So you haven't had the highest caliber of, of uh, politicians that work at local government. It's all okay. very kind of low intensity um, politics. You know, it's, it's grabbing as much as you can from each other type of approach. At national level, I think there's a better shot that you would get a more serious kind of engagement with coalitions. So we've seen a bit of that already with this multi-party charter where parties are actually getting together before the election to say, how would we work together afterwards, which is a slightly more mature approach. Yes, but which which are those parties that are talking in that direction? Tell me uh, your your coalition dream dream team. Like uh, what what would it actually look like? Who who would who would be who would be in it? Again, we this is round the corner, so we know exactly who the options are at this point. It's not like we don't yeah, know what ideas we have to play with. I think it's it's not so much a question of a dream team as sort of trying to make the best of the reality that emerges, <laughs> because. <laughs> You know, the ANC is likely to emerge as the largest party. It might fall under 50, but it will still be the largest party. So it will be the one, <clears throat> sorry, that's um, initiating the coalition politics. Um, and the question is, which way will it go? I mean, if it goes to into coalition with the EFF, I think it's pretty dire because the that EFF puts will... The other that puts you in the, the bad scenario. Yeah. Because I think the EFF, it will be more or less a reverse takeover. The way the EFF operates, they'll insist on quite a big chunk of government, some senior portfolios, and then they'll behave as if they are the government and make all kinds of policy pronouncements and cause quite a lot of chaos. People and, who read World War II history will understand how that works out. Yeah. So, yeah, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, so we've seen it, seen the movie. Um, I think, on the other hand, if the ANC looks to the centre, um, there are parties there, and there's the MPC itself, um, there could be some movement towards a more rational kind of policy environment. And then finally, if the MPC gets enough votes on its own, it might be able to form a government, perhaps a minority government. I think the spread between the ANC and the MPC has narrowed. It was uh, 48 to 34. So if you take all the parties of the MPC and you put their votes together, we did a survey a year ago and we did one again this last month. And from a year ago, it was 48 to 34 and that spread is now uh, 41 to 36. So it's a five point spread. And it's, you know there's the possibility that the MPC could emerge as the biggest block post the election. It could be a great in the ruling coalition. It could be like New Zealand European politics. Yeah, it could be pretty, pretty crazy. That 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 would be a, a quite a big wild card. So yeah. if, you, if you want to put like let, let's let's put some chips on the table in terms of the probabilities of the three coalitions across the the spectrum from as we said good to weird to 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 bad. What where would you bet if you wanted to put probabilities or odds on the differences between an ANC EFF coalition, an ANC more benign parties coalition, or a complete wild card, mixed bag, who knows what we're going to get coalition, which I, I would say is probably my, probably probably a, 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 thin, a thin sliver at this point, yeah. but we can, we can consider it. I think, so I think it's pretty much 50-50 between the first two options. You know, a lot of it depends, for example, how far the ANC falls. If it falls down to the low 40s or 40, it's going to, you know, ideally it's going to look for a single partner that makes life a lot less complex. 
um, and the EFF will be quite tempting. And they were A and C. Let's be honest. This is just yeah, like fun coming home, right? Right. Yeah. And but there are a lot of people in the ANC that are actually spoken out against that option. So it's quite an interesting debate happening within the party. I mean, the former Gauteng Premier, David Makura, has said there shouldn't be an alliance with the EFF. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that. And then I think the, the possibility of the ANC looking to one of the parties or one or two of the parties in the centre, like the IFP, possibly, I think that could be quite a strong possibility. Even the DA has been talked about by some people um, in the ANC, although with with long thunder, as they say in Afrikaans. Um, so, you know, the, uh, Snooki Zikalala said that, you know, if the DA was less racist, it could be an option. Um, so there's, uh, the door is open. Okay, so you, you would say there is the, it's a reasonable person could consider the ANC forming a coalition with someone other than the EFF, which is something that, of course, foreign foreign friends and families and all the rest of it are always concerned about, given the way that these sorts of things have played out across the, the Southern Hemisphere. So, so you, you'd yeah. say that, the, that the, the, the odds are pretty tight there. That's yeah. interesting to me, given that when looking at all your scenarios, the one scenario you didn't consider at all was that the ANC reformed at all. And for me... The ANC reforming, you, you you kind of discounted that possibility altogether in your book, like right yeah. in terms of that that's, that wasn't even an, an option. Although you're talking yeah. now about a, a wild card mixed bag coalition government would be an option, but a reformed ANC you declared was, or you you kind of made the point wasn't an option in your particular scenario set, yeah. which I find interesting because that's almost a counterpoint to the idea of the ANC forming a coalition with a more centrist or more actually democratic party, because that would for me kind of be a reformist scenario. So how do how do you sort of justify that that tension there? Sorry if that's yeah. that uh, I think that. <laughs> I think it would be, um, there would be some sort of reform involved in that scenario. But I think the ANC has had a pretty strong run post Zuma at demonstrating its ability slash inability to reform. And I think the, you know, the jury is in. I mean, they've not, they failed pretty spectacularly. So, you know, because I think there's some structural problems within the ANC. So, you know, for example, an interesting fact, the president, the minister of finance, the minister of trade and industry, are all former general secretaries of trade unions. That is not a hotbed of reform. Um, and so, you know, the constituencies that they have within the party kind of limit their ability really to deal with some of the big economic things. For example, sell off the state-owned enterprises that are complete uh, loss makers and so on, and do a bit of privatization, public-private partnerships and so on. All of that stuff's held back, I think, by those those problems. Okay, so it's so not not quite as rosy as it as it as it might appear. So anyway, I'll I'll leave that out there for for listeners, viewers to to make their own prognosis on how that changes the the bets in the coalition. <laughs> Well, we say sort of you know spectrum but yeah. the, other, the other sort of spectrum that we have here is that there's no coalition required that the ANC still retains a majority and that there's some sort of business as usual business as usual that could either be improved by external macroeconomic conditions where rising tides lift all boats even badly behaved boats like our own or the status quo uh, affected by macroeconomic conditions that are, shall we say, less favorable. So we don't get so lucky. So that is really a, a choice of, of, of luck that makes the difference between the sort of the yeah. ugly, ugly there, bad. Some, I think there's some luck, but there are also some choices. So, for example, um, you know, it makes sense for us to be friendly with China because China is a major consumer of resources. But we need to also understand that we have a trade deficit with China and that we sell finished goods like automobiles and other machinery and manufactured goods um, to Europe and America. And, you know, so there's got to be some sort of balance in policy. And if we put all our money in the, in the BRICS basket, 
it's quite dangerous. I mean, China's contracting economically. The Americans yeah. are wondering aloud if they should carry on with any trade preferences for South Africa. So, you know, these choices have to be made very smartly. I mean, I think the big problem with South Africa is that we haven't played to our strength, which is that we're, you know, we're down in the southern tip of Africa. We don't have to become major players on one or other side of these big global alliances. We can play them off against each other. Yeah, we've had that conversation on the show quite a bit, that the the bets on sort of the past or the future of South Africa is quite a, is quite an interesting one. But also BRICS is all promise and not fact. It's very much sort of bird in the bush, not bird in the hand, kind of kind of a, <laughs> a thing there. But at the same time, the threats of the, the managed decline of the West is not is not to be entirely discounted either. Although I would sort of pin China almost to the side there. That you certainly shouldn't be making any bets on China's future growth because China's got one policy and it's always had one policy for its entire existence, which like if you look at that histogram map, it's just so beautiful China's the only unbroken line they expand and contract but according to their own terms and when they pull up the drawbridge and go into an isolationist period they're certainly not taking anyone anyone with them either and we know their youth unemployment is probably almost as high as ours you know like they stop counting when the numbers stop looking so stop looking so good China's not one to look at, but at the same time, the other bricks, there is pockets of growth and perhaps the only pockets of growth looking at a 50 to 100 year time horizon. So there is a bit of a bet to be made there. There's also a bet around morality and values and bedfellows. But I think the, the, the choice is not necessarily that clear if you're going to have to try and pick between sort of Washington and Beijing. It's more a case of how do you play without actually choosing, right? How do you, how do you, how do you, Switzerland in this case. That's really the only option we can have is not to make enemies as opposed to making strong friends. Uh, I, I would say trade neutrality is the, the only smart choice for, for a country such as ourselves that has so little actual real bargaining power in the world. Yeah. Even as we do have bargaining power as a representative of the African continent, which is kind of a subtopic. But anyway, we kind of we're kind of going off course there because yeah. regardless, <laughs> it still it still comes down to the case of whether the ANC gets a 50% majority or not, whether the we get to continue pretending that we can sort of kick this can down the road a bit further, which will not make us unique in any way, sense or form. I mean, the whole global economy is based on kicking the can down to the next generation as far as we can go and hoping the whole thing doesn't blow up before we get to retire or buy property, yeah. right? I mean, that's that's the whole, that's the way the whole debt-based <laughs> economy works. So like betting on the status quo is probably quite comfortable for most people, especially for South Africans who are quite comfortable with living on the edge of chaos. That's one thing we're good at. I mean, this has been like for my entire lifetime and for my parents too. South Africa was never a sure bet. So if we can just continue things going for another four years, isn't that for most South Africans, perhaps the most comfortable scenario, almost regardless of what happens with the global economic condition? I mean, we survived COVID, we've survived great depressions and great recessions and all the rest of it. And we know how to, we know this enemy. We know yeah. how to survive yeah. unmanaged decline in, yeah. in South Africa. So yeah. how does that change the sort of odds of the scenarios for you? Because this is for me the, the critical thing. The, the reason perhaps that we have such voter apathy is that it's better the devil you know and the devil you don't. Of course, many people are very scared of the ANC EFF coalition, as they should be, because the last thing we need is more populism, you know? Like that, that's clearly not working for us. We don't want to accelerate this decline. It's much more comfortable, even if it is a declining situation, even if the ANC is not reformable that sort of longer that longer flatter slope to wherever we're ending up is i think a, a much more comfortable choice for people it keeps people away from the polls it keeps you disengaged because the chances of voting for a for a not sure bet on a mixed odds coalition just seems to be a lot more scary i'm not sure if you come across this sort of argument yeah. like they're like, no, no, I think so. like you know, other people are like, of course, just don't vote for the don't vote for what's not working. But you're like, but what if the what if comes next is worse? We can handle this. Yeah. I mean, I think the scenario where the ANC pulls it out the fire and gets 50%, um, you know, is 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 possible. I mean, I don't think it's a remote uh possibility. But I mean, the way that democracy works or the way that the core mechanism works 
is that when you have greater political competition, everybody has to be better in order to succeed. So for the ANC to get to that 50%, they literally will have to deal with load shedding before the election, because that's one of the single biggest things that stands in the way of their electoral support right now. So they if they do that. That, I'm going to interrupt you, they can do that because in, in the short term, you can just stop doing maintenance and you can cut that load shedding down for six months. You, you can kick that can. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's literally been the strategy. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that the can's been kicked a lot though. And, you know, I don't know if there's much can left to kick other than really bringing on some renewable energy and dealing with these you know, um, power stations in a serious way. But if they don't do that, then they, they're, they're very unlikely to claw their way back because the other variables are almost impossible for them to turn around in this time framework. Jobs, for example, um, crime is endemic. There's no way you're going to reform the police force and deal with that issue ahead. And corruption is something they're not really dealing with. Um, What's just, the insane? Yeah, this, you know, I think that Ramaphosa started dealing with it, but then the point was reached where he realized that it was so endemic, um, and if he dealt with it seriously, there wouldn't be much left of the party. Um, so he just kind of backed off. Um, that just adds credence to the, this is not a reformable solution here. That's, yeah, if we exactly. are... We are betting men who believe that by placing your bets, you are changing the odds. That whole sort of pragmatic optimism conversation we have here yeah. all the time. You should probably be throwing your bets into into a mixed bag coalition as the best chance. So yeah. that would be that's the but only. I, mean, way I think the interesting, the interesting thing. <laughs> Ramaphosa's um, anti-corruption fight. The victims of that have been Jacob Zuma, who faces charges. It's William Kieser who was, uh, you know, removed from office because of the rule that you can't have these charges over your head inside the party, and Ace Makashule. So it turns out that the three people that have really had consequences for corruption happen to be the president's three rivals in the party. It's a very Chinese kind of solution, really. Beyond that, nothing, nothing really has happened. So, so not hopeful in that regard. Uh, you, if, if you had to choose, we, we're, we're, we're preferring the, the high stakes game of coalition governance rather than the still high stakes, but at least known odds game of ANC gets to continue running the place. I suppose the question is, what is what do other South Africans actually think? Like, is, uh, is, 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 is a bad scenario, like, really the bad choice if you have any reason to believe that taking your bets against that placing your chips placing your votes placing your odds on a much more uncertain coalition party where the chips can fall in very different odds what is the appetite for that sort of risk and upheaval in the south african consciousness given the fact that it's really sucked here for the last five years. We had a shitty COVID. COVID was shitty for everyone across the world, but it was particularly shitty here in terms of the outcomes, in terms of lives and livelihoods. It's it was it was really bad for most people, and not many people have recovered post that. I mean, aside from the yeah. North Point percent have got much, much, much richer, but that's a different story. You know, the the Matthew effects are a well at play here. But let's let's not worry about the the zero point one percent because they they have money and don't really care and and options and like the, the political odds are just not as extraordinary for them. But for the majority of South Africans in the middle classes and in the unemployed classes, is there an appetite? for trying something new right now? Or are people just out of that sort of optimism? Yeah, I think there is. A cool question that I'm thinking about, like, you know, like how do you, I mean, how do these conversations all over the place? So much of our work is about the future and talking about yeah. how do you get to vote? How do you get people excited? I would count that people are scared, not just, not just tired. We've been tired for a long time, but also scared yeah. about those options. No, I think that there is a big appetite for change. There certainly is. I mean, uh, people are having it really tough. I mean, the unemployment levels, the youth unemployment, the collapse of education, the struggling 
health system, a lot of options are being closed for a lot of people. As you say, the bubble at the top is paying for its own education and health and, you know, has its coffee shops and trust funds in for them. the island man, don't worry about them, they're fine. Yeah. So that actually might be the the but that's a tiny minority in this country. They're not going to switch actually. the boats, no. <laughs> Absolutely no. not. But I think out there at the at the grassroots level there is a big shift. And it's actually going towards the EFF. So I mean our survey also showed the EFF up from eleven to seventeen percent over that's the last massive. year. So I think a lot of those voters that are in a desperate situation are saying like let's just do something radical. Um, which is quite a quite a dangerous place. And, and when you talk about that sentiment shift, is that among the current voting base or the as of yet unregistered apathetic voting base? So that this yeah. is the, like, to use an analogy, it's very similar to like the American le election of the the Trump versus like Clinton sort of election, which was which was a surprise to many people. But actually, if you look at it in sheer numbers, Trump didn't so much win as he was the beneficiary of people not turning out to vote for Hillary, right? I mean, there's a, there's a difference between winning hearts and minds and just being kind of the last man standing. So in terms no. of the if there, is that sentiment shift new people that are really willing now to put their effort into the participative process of democracy or is this a swing vote from people turning away from where they have voted in the past towards a more radical alternative and i think that's also quite an important yeah question. i think it's a swing vote because the decline in the anc kind of mirrors the rise in the eff and it also the period in which the ret the radical economic transformation faction departed from the anc in the house and ace makashule and company so voters that were loyal to them i think have gone for the for the populist option out there, which is the EFF. EFF's problem really has been that it actually has a lot more support than it shows in elections because there's a very low registration in that 18 to 25 voter cohort. I think it's about 25% last election. Um, and that's just registration. So of those even fewer votes. So it's, you know, it's, it has these giant marches in the cities but it doesn't really hasn't shown on the on elections because people are not registered to vote and don't want to be part of formal politics. But I think this bump comes from the ANC and from some very clever, clever politics from the EFF. They really use their birthday as a sort of mini national election campaign, holding rallies all around the country, putting posters up and so on. You and funded so, them, by the way. Where did that money come from? Do you know? I don't know. Standard Bank doesn't seem to have the answer, so I'm not sure. <laughs> so it's just an interesting question. If anyone knows the answer, phone in. Tell us. Tell us. Tell us. <laughs> okay, so that was that was well noted. They've done quite well in the marketing advertising campaign, and who doesn't love a good outfit, right? I do appreciate. Yeah. You know, like putting in the effort and, and, and doing the thing. I know, I know. It's it's a, some people think it's a bit like self. It's it's a, almost embarrassing to to commit to that. But no, people love a caricature. People like a celebrity. People like a look, and uh, you can't you can't deny them that at all. But that's yeah. still gets to the point around the voter apathy and the fact that if all we are doing is trading votes votes among the initial or the already registered and already voting voting base, we're going to get more of the same. I'd say that we're probably more likely then to to more move towards actually some sort of ANC slash ANC EFF majority, which for me is very much the same sort of thing. It's a more radical ANC or a slightly less say so the, the ANC that we know today, which is it doesn't really change my life so much, although it will change other people's. Yeah. And but that's a that's a sort of side point. The point is that where you where you actually get into the the higher stakes odds are when you're getting new people to vote, and getting new people to vote are unknown entities. It does favor the coalition rather than the ANC dominant sort of scenario there. Uh, but the coalition across that weird good bad spectrum we spoke about earlier new voters could vote for small parties like what's the new one we've got now like sara party you never heard before but they've got a large marketing budget they've got posters up everywhere right um will new registering voters whether they're young votes or people just have never voted before will they increase the odds of messy coalitions surprise coalitions or will they, as you suggest, increase the odds of a strong EFF win scoops up that core demographic, which from the analyst perspective, I mean, that's the that's the 
we've got the youth bulge, we've got the unemployed youth, like populists should be what they gravitate towards. I do have my own theories as to why that hasn't happened, but um, I will I will try try and try and try and avoid the temptation to to get into that. But from your perspective, if drives to get new voters and particularly young voters registered are successful, does that for you bode more or less uh, weight to probabilities of an ANC EFF coalition or a non EFF coalition? Where do you think the non voters will land if we can get yeah. people to? Yeah, I think that if registration goes up dramatically and there's a new cohort that enters voting, it's not going to favor the ANC because it will, <laughs> it'll, be favor, it'll favor either, either some wild cards or two. Yeah. So I think it'll be a tussle and probably shared between the EFF and the other parties. So there's a lot of uh, kind of expectation that we'll have a high turnout. So there will be people voting that maybe didn't vote. And there are a lot of theories about that. And it's very difficult to, to sort of back any of them really. I mean, it's not very empirical, for example. There's the theory that people don't transition from one party to another. They transition to apathy and then they vote for another party. And that there's been a lot of transition to apathy in the last two elections. And maybe those people are now ready. They've cut their loyalties and are ready to choose another party. So that could be a factor if they, if they decide to get involved in the election. But it's very <laughs> hypothetical. Yeah. And youth apathy is our biggest chunk. I mean, yeah. it's, it's extraordinary in South Africa how how less engaged, how, how democracy or the engagement in democracy is negatively correlated with uh, with the age spectrum. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It is. It's extraordinary. And I, I think the party that cracks that one will really do exceptionally well, but none of them really have. I, I would suggest that the reason that that the, the 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 fact that there is still youth apathy, although the EFF has been on the menu for three election cycles, tells me a pretty as a pretty strong indication that what the EFF is selling is not what the youth are buying. That there is a vacancy there, a, a job vacancy for a, a new flavor of populist, and I think that the reason that the EFF has not succeeded in converting our populist youth towards his populist party is because he's forgotten one very critical thing about populism. And that is that you have to promise something. You can't just promise to take things away from other people. You also have to promise to give things to the people that are going to vote for you. And I don't think the EFF has done that. The EFF's yeah. policies, much like the DA, they've made very similar mistakes, have been anti-X, anti-Y, not pro-A, B, and C. I yeah, think what is that the vision? Yeah. There's no promise. There's no promised land uh, ahead for voting for really any of them. And I think mm. that that's, that's the apathy challenge. And that's also the challenge that came through in all of your scenarios, because this is the thing. All the scenarios are still framed around the ANC, the counterpoint, yeah. framed yeah. towards the past. There are no scenarios and there are no policy options that are framed towards the future. And until they are future orientated and promise orientated, whether those promises are fulfillable or not, is actually irrelevant when it comes to politics. Politics is all advertising, but you have to actually be advertising something that is appetizing towards the people. And I think that that's the, the frustration on reading your yeah. book, you know, on any sort yeah. of political analysis in South Africa, is that we are kind of stuck. We're stuck within ANC flavored future whether there's slightly more ANC or slightly less ANC, there's no other future actually on yeah. the on the table. It's just different yeah. dials. It's it's a spectrum rather than a than a than an entirely new vision. So all your scenarios are actually quite close together, and and I can't really fault you on that because that's the point. We don't yeah. we we're, there's a missing piece. There's a there's an open vacancy that could be filled by both um, positive or negative characters. But um, until until that piece materializes, we are kind of stuck. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very good observation. I mean, there's a, there's a lack of imagination out there, I think. Um, a lot of these people that are entering politics do offer and do promise something more interesting, you know, um, but they're unlikely to really make a dent. You know, it's very hard to get into this contest. It's a very yeah. crowded field. There are a lot of people that sound similar to you and they're already, their vote is already secured. 
So you've got to do something quite dramatic to pull people away. Um, I mean, I think, for example, if instead of you having a pre-election coalition, all of those parties of the centre got together and said, we're forming one new party called, I don't know, you know, make South Africa great again or whatever. Um, That's not <laughs> <good>. <laughs> um, you know, that might ignite some imagination um, because you then sort of have an opportunity to get away from the old politics and present something positive and entirely new based on your, your agenda. But uh, they've chosen to go the path of a pre-election coalition, which I think doesn't ignite the same level of excitement. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> that's the there's more, there's, there's a higher scenario. likelihood. Of that's that's people... a good scenario, like the, the okay, fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, well, no, fine, yeah. Um, so our, our, uh, our survey also showed that... All scenarios. It's the best one you can work with. <laughs> Actually, we should make that one of the scenarios. And, yeah, well, no, fine. Um, but the, there is a higher propensity for people to vote for an opposition party since the launch of the MPC. So it has it has inspired a little bit, but it hasn't I think, led to a dramatic shift. Okay, so anyway, looking ahead, let's just get a, a general a general sort of a feeling for, for your own position looking ahead. I don't know if you're familiar since you dabbled in the world of futures. I can put you on the spot here and since you decided to make scenarios. Have you heard of the Pollock game? Which is where we decide uh, on a scale of one to ten, how optimistic are you for the future of South Africa right now? Me, personally. Um, pers let's just let's make it personal. Consult my co-authors. Um, yeah, I know. I think it's um, probably about a I'm actually on the more optimistic side. Being optimist, more being nine, yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a seven. You're a seven. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so we've we've we already found out what the optimistic scenarios are. We'll see, we are there. There's another question on this matrix too, and that is, um, how much agency do you think you have to actually influence that outcome? Again, on a scale of not being none, ten being quite strong. Do you think? Do you think that uh, your vote matters? Your efforts are going to make a difference. Your book. It's going to change perspectives. Oh yeah, no, that's a that's a ten. <laughs> no. Like super, super. <laughs> you 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 sure you got this? <laughs> I think the vote matters more than ever. Yeah, uh, because there's a real political contest emerging. So I think that's up. As for the book, I don't know. Um, yeah, can't judge that one. I'm afraid. Well, there's all there's all the pieces that you're putting together. We can only put these ideas out there and uh, just throw them at the wall and, and see what sticks. But that's how history moves. History moves when sort of ideas that are lying around are picked up and run by more energetic future men and women. But anyway, mm -hmm. that was the most optimistic work, I think, to sort of end this conversation. Unless you've got some yeah. other points you want to clear up. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, yeah, Ray, where can people find you if they want to engage with your work at the Brain Trust Foundation or with yourself? And um, yeah, if you've got any closing thoughts, over to you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a great disruption of a system that's been in place you know, since 1948, there's been a dominant, there have been two dominant parties in South African politics. So we've only really experienced a kind of dominant party and minority party set up in this country. So it's pretty massive disruption that we're in the middle of, where, you know, and to judge what happens in the middle is not wise, you know, should hold our powder and see what happens what comes out at the end. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm optimistic. I think greater political competition makes everyone better and we're heading for a better outcome. Excellent. And you can get hold of us at, on our website, rentistfoundation.org. Excellent. I will put all those details in the, the show notes and the various captions on various places where people might be catching this conversation. But uh, Ray, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And hopefully see you around. Okay, good. 
That's right, I'm wearing red. I did that very deliberately to try and capture your attention instead of my usual black. I did that because I've got quite important and very exciting, for me at least, announcement. And that is that our new book, Rescuing Our Republic, which has been written in conjunction with my friends and colleagues at Discourse ZA, is now out and about in bookstores across South Africa and available online for anyone else that is curious about South Africa. And as I've said before, as a futurist and a trained analyst and economist, I do think that South Africa is one of the clearest bellwethers as to where the weird Western world is headed. And as such, there's something you can learn from us at the bottom of Africa. We are ahead of quite a few of the trends that you're just wrapping your heads around. Anyway, this book is based on some of our most popular and most revealing, interesting, and important conversations that we've had over the last couple of years at Discourse ZA, which is a YouTube channel you should absolutely subscribe to. It's also available as a podcast if you're interested in anything to do with politics, philosophy, and economics. But the conversations in this particular book are focused on, as the title says, rescuing our republic, or more specifically, what civil society and individuals should be thinking about and doing and starting if they are interested in investing in a future for South Africa that we actually want to be a part of. Anyway, I would love for you to read this book and to give it to someone either that you like or that you hate, because the purpose of this book is to kickstart conversations. Conversations around big, interesting, ugly even, but important ideas that are worthy of debate. So if you're planning on being bored or understimulated at a family or friend event this festive season, this is the book you need to give you the conversation starters to start a debate or a fight with those who you love or love to hate most.